Well, good evening. We're starting up in about two minutes. We have Spencer Stewart with us tonight with a really excellent program. Looking forward to hearing what Spencer has to say about collection collectors and uh, all kinds of things related to to the kind of collecting that we do. So we're going to get started in just about a minute, so we should be just fine with that. I'm going to rearrange a couple of things here, and I'll be right back at you. That's Spencer, by the way. He's the he's the good-looking one. There we go. So we got a nice crowd coming in tonight. Looks like people from all over the country. I don't see any uh, folks from overseas, but we're covering North America tonight, which will be just great. We run about an hour, as you know, and this is uh, Manuscript Monday. We do on every first Monday of every month, unless there's some big holiday. Then we do Manuscript Monday on a Tuesday. Actually, the July July 4th, which is uh, Independence Day in the USA is uh, is on a Monday, so we'll do that one on a Tuesday. But our June is going to be the first Monday of the month, and uh, and all will go well. So with that, we're going to get things started. My old, uh, my old boss said, if you're not late, you're early. So I want to welcome you to Manuscript Monday for May. We're going to talk about the life cycle of collections and the collectors who build them. And our special guest is Spencer Stewart. My name is Brian Cathanis. I'm your host and I host all of these two. I'm a member of the uh, Manuscript Society and a trustee and the managing partner of National Appraisal Consultants. So let's fire it up and we'll see what we're gonna do here. So who's the sponsor? The sponsor is the Manuscript Society, an organization, a not-for-profit organization, 501c3. And what we do is preserve manuscripts. We educate the public about manuscripts, understand why they're important. We run educational seminars, national conferences, we have a, a superb scholarship program and special awards that uh, we give out to people who are uh, mostly students who are involved in preserving, uh, researching, or involved in the collection and protection of manuscripts. And we also run an annual conference, which happens every year. I guess that's why they call it an annual conference. And uh, I'll tell you more about that in just a little bit. So why a webinar? It's the easiest, cheapest, and best way to reach out to members of our organization and people who might become members of our organizations to collectors and scholars and folks who are interested in this field. We have on board members of the Manuscript Society. We have members of the International Society of Appraisers. The Society of American Archivists are with us. There are book collectors, manuscript collectors. I see a couple of dealers out there and, uh, and researchers and scholars and professors as well. Why now? Why not? Um, it's a great time to find out what's going on in the world of collecting, and it's really important to know that. Who is invited? We invite just about anybody. If you have friends, you have folks who are interested in manuscripts, collecting, not necessarily just manuscript, but collecting in general, rare books, all kinds of things, just about everything but Beanie Babies. We got a call about Beanie, Beanie Babies today. We get them every day. So we invite just about anybody, and you as a participant and a member of the organization or some folks who like to attend can invite anybody you want as what well. what we're going to cover i'll get to that in just a little bit and uh, uh how to get more information i'll talk to you about that too so with that let's just fire it up let me tell you about spencer spencer w stewart provides advisory services to private collectors as well as institutions aiding in the design and execution of collecting collection development cataloging and deaccessioning strategies. The rest I have up there, he provides it. I mentioned that as well. He holds a master's degree in the history of art um, and uh, out in London, England. He received the director's award upon graduation. He took a position with certainly a well-known and prestigious auction house called Bonhams, which has a worldwide presence. We work closely with North American Rare Books and Manuscripts Department in Toronto, as well as New York. Um, Spencer is from Vancouver, and uh, that's a wonderful place to be, and uh, we're glad he's here today. He's an alumna of the Colorado Antiquary Book Seminars and completed courses coursework through the Rare Book School out of the University of Virginia. An incredible place. You want to learn more about books and about collecting and about binding and about uh, cataloging and collating. That's a great place to go. <clears throat> so in concert with his advising, he's an active writer, a lecturer on the histories of printed word, for a variety of publications, including Book Collector, Manuscripts, which you probably know, Amphora, as well as occasionally with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. There are three or four bits of information that we provided to you before this started 
if you went to the Manuscript Society site, you'll see some downloads. You can go there after to manuscript.org if you haven't seen Spencer's handouts, and uh, and you're good to go. Now he is somewhere. I got to make sure. I'm gonna we're gonna switch over now so that he can put his um, <clears throat> so he can put his uh, uh, slide presentation up. So I am going to change presenters to Spencer, our panelist, and I'm going to do that. And there he is. Welcome, Spencer. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm just Good. going to... I, now go ahead. I'm, yep. People see this? I'm going to take a look and see where we are. Um, I've given you that, so let's see what that looks like. I see you, but I don't see your screen just yet. There you go. All right, you are up. I see life cycle of a collection, Manuscript Society, May 2nd. And you should see that too. Let me just do very briefly uh, before we start up. If you have questions in the in your control panel, this is for all of our participants, your control panel, there's a place to ask questions. There's a place to chat. You can type your questions right in there. If you, I'm going to put something in the chat section right now, and it's going to go to the entire audience. And I'm just going to write welcome, and I'm going to put my cell number in here. If you're having trouble, any technical problems with sound or whatever, I'm going to ask you to text me, uh, not call me, and I will send this to you now. So that's my cell phone number if you have any questions. There's a little spot to raise your hand. You'll see that little spot there where you can raise your hand or lower your hand. It's counterintuitive. You can put your hand up. You can put your hand down. Um, if you raise your hand or raise your hand and lower it a couple of times, I will find you and uh, and I will uh, ask you to either write a question or write a comment. But in the, as we move into it, I'm uh, delighted and honored to present to you Spencer W. Stewart. Spencer, it's all yours. I'm going to turn my camera off and my mic off and let you run the show. Great, Brian. Thank you very much. And uh, to begin, I'd like to also thank uh, Brad, the editor of Manuscripts. Uh, we were in conversation for the last you know, six months and uh, putting together an article for Manuscripts. And uh, he, was, he started this uh, invitation. So I, I'm delighted to be speaking to you this evening. And, uh, and I look forward to the conversation that we'll be having uh, out, of, out of some of the uh, ideas that I present here. Um, you know, as Brian mentioned from the from the outset, you know, as a collection advisor, what I do is I, I work with collectors at a variety of different moments in their collecting practice. You know, so thinking about early collectors, people who are starting out in terms of how they are setting up their research and they're thinking about uh, building a collection, uh, some of their methodologies and what's the information out there to make informed decisions about building their collections, uh, working with People who are sort of in the middle portion of their of their collecting when they're starting to uh, really think about the shape of their collections and uh, maybe they're going into a, a more focused uh, angle of their collecting practice or they're starting to uh, switch gears and and deciding to you know deaccession a certain portion in order to allocate more funds to build the collection in another direction these sorts of things and then. Uh, and then more mature collectors who are thinking about these processes of deaccessioning and uh, and what's the legacy of their collection moving forward. And so, in doing this, it's interesting. I, I you know I work with a number of different demographics of of collectors, uh, people who are in their 80s all the way to collectors who were in their late 20s into their 30s. And you know, in in having these discussions with the different generations that are engaging in the practice of collecting rare books manuscripts, prints, uh, photography, these are sort of the areas I work in mostly. You know, it's interesting to think about, there's often these conversations about the models uh, that people use to characterize collecting. You know, these discussions of, of getting the bug or, or the fever or, a, you know, a gentle madness, these sorts of conversations. And these are very much archetypes, you know, these are historically defined moments of, of collecting practice. And, you know, they're often also created around the context of how does one gather and develop their collections. You know, in, in many ways, these discussions of, of getting the fever or the bug or whatever it might be, they're, they're connected to 
a, a period of time in which it was a feeling of almost impassioned collecting, something where you may not have all the information. And so the feeling that something is being offered to you, it might never come again. And this is sort of changing uh, pretty dramatically. I'm, I'm, I'm learning it through a lot of the younger collectors that I'm working with. Uh, you know, and the methodologies that they employ, uh, the, and the engagement with the, uh, certainly with the internet and how that's changing and indicating a shift in the way in which collections are, are coming to be. Now, when I think about the, the various collectors and, and, and clients I've worked with, not only in the auction business, but also within the context of being a collection advisor, I like to think of it across a spectrum. Uh, starting with, on one hand, uh, object-based collecting, and on the other, what I refer to as idea-based collecting. Now, the characteristics of these are, you, know, you think of object-based collecting is, is very much along the lines of a, a completist practice. It's established through references, through bibliography, uh, through previously existing collections, often ones that are deposited in institutions that are used as reference for developing the collections. These are also uh, collections that are very much well known within uh, the trade as well and within auctions and the collecting community. And so there's very much a, a sense of an established value of the items, or at least a conversation around these discussions. And very often as well, these collections uh, manifest themselves in single medium. So they focus on say books, for instance. Uh, this collection on the left is one I worked with, which particularly focused on modern Irish authors. Uh, it was a couple and they collected together over a period of 30 years developing a, a collection of these sorts. And in this sense, it takes on very much a kind of arborescent model, a, a sort of building out, uh, there's a core group of objects or items that really found the idea and then it branches out into you know sort of auxiliary uh, connections. Um, now there's another manifestation that I think has always been present in the act of collecting but certainly the uh, technological influence of the internet to the act of to the practice of collecting itself has, is making this a, a model that I'm seeing more of in uh, the younger demographic that are building collections. And this is, a, this is an idea-based collecting practice, one that's often, and, and I'm using the example here, as you can see, of uh, Lisa Unger Baskin's collection of women's labor, which was exhibited at the Grolier and is now placed in uh, Duke University. And along the lines of, of, of Baskin's collection, it, it, it's often collections that are formed around questions and they're formed around the absence of, of a collection of objects to, to explore an idea. So in the case of, of Lisa Unger Baskin's collection, the question of where, where is women's work represented uh, within visual culture and within print culture? Now, on the other hand, you think of object-based collections are very much statements. Uh, they are often, compared in relation to other collecting practice. And so in that sense, they are very much tied into one another in quite a close way. Whereas the collector that engages in this kind of idea-based collecting, it's very much, you know, they're, they're kind of going off the beaten path in a way. Uh, and, you know, this has, this has lots of merits to it in terms of building the collection. You can, you can, you can acquire certain things at perhaps uh, less, less than uh, more established routes of collecting. Um, and, and you can also have a little bit of creativity that perhaps connects more with your kind of, uh, you know, the autobiography or, or, or your life and how that relates to your collecting practice. Now, but in both cases, I'd say, you know, again, this is a spectrum. I, it's not something in which it's either or. I see both kind of playing with one another uh, in the collecting and certainly uh, the present collecting that's taking place. I think that there's a shift that's taking place into a more rhizomatic practice. It's not just because of uh, the medium by which people are engaging with catalogs, uh, you know, book fairs, auctions, things of this nature, but certainly it does lend itself to perhaps exploring uh, unintended opportunities that may have not been uh, available to the collector at an earlier period. Now, 
often what I say with with people when they're building out their collections is that you know once you sort of identify yourself as being a collector that, that it's really important to sort of start thinking about what are the current conditions under which you're building your collection and thinking about yourself as a custodian of these of these objects so you know a, a triangle of thinking of of the time that it takes what what are you willing to invest in terms of research is this something that you are going to engage in yourself or is this something that you're engaging with with uh, people within the trade or a, uh, a collections advisor be it uh, the discussion of space, uh, access to your collection, and making sure that it's protected but also accessible at the same time, and then uh, the financial investment or, or, or the engagement of how you're building out your collection. Uh, what are the intake rates? What are some items that uh, you know are really uh, key to your building of your collection? Uh, which are ones that are, you're willing to perhaps pay for a lesser copy in order to simply have an example? These sorts of uh, you know qualitative questions of of the collection that you're trying to build, um, in order to think about it really as a kind of a, a gradual developing process. Now, um, when when you are building a collection, be it through object based collecting or this kind of idea based collecting, you know you're in both cases you're very much setting up a uh, you know a world that people can navigate through. Uh, through these ideas and some of the expressions that are 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 enacting themselves or realizing themselves through the objects that make up your collection. And so in that sense, you know, as soon as you sort of get your sense of being a collector, uh, of identifying in that sense, you know, it's really important to start to develop some form of catalog. Um, you know, the, the records of this sort allow you to really develop a map of the collection that you're putting together. And in this case, you know, I have here Ledger, Excel, and some softwares. And, you know, these connect to, you know, Ledger is easier for tens of items, Excel for hundreds, and, uh, and on through to softwares for uh, thousands of items. Um, in one particular case, I'm working with a collector that's developing into a historical site and uh, we're making use of softwares because simply there's so many items and the ability to uh, create certain um, connections with with those objects. Uh, something that I'm noticing within the, the demographics is that there's oftentimes uh, with the with more mature collectors that they're they either have a written out ledger catalog or they're using uh, Microsoft Word and it's happening uh, sort of after the fact of the creation of a collection over a certain amount of decades. Uh, what's interesting is to see um, in emerging collectors, uh, sort of younger demographic of collectors that are, are building their collections presently, are really starting from the bottom. They're making use of Excel and, and other softwares, uh, you know, right from the get-go. And it's interesting to see how that gets a sense of the connection um, between your collection and the opportunities that are out there in somewhat real time. So in looking at catalogs that are available in looking at auctions that are coming up and pairing them against your collection in terms of the content of your collection, but also how, what you spent on the, on the, your previous items that were similar. There's this ability to make um, comparative, uh, you know, uh, comparisons quite quickly and really have a sense of the kind of connection with your collecting as it is developing. It's important in a lot of ways to catalog as well to really bridge that gap between the impression that one has of your collection of their collection and the actual contents of the collection. Um, you know, is there, is it an image that you have of of a completeness, or you know, looking through the catalog will get you a sense of of you know what are some of the items that are lacking? What what are some of the spaces in between that you'd like to fill, or what are some items where there might be a a pathway that's perhaps tangential to what you're really focusing on moving forward with your collecting and the world you're trying to communicate and uh, and build. And so in all of this, you know, this discussion of the collector, the collector being a historically determined idea that present collectors, they, you know, they identify with certain images of how they collect, which is usually connected to a kind of a history of collecting. There's then the collection the collection that you're putting together, the idea that you have about it, uh, about its completeness, what are some of the stories that it is trying to communicate. And then there's really the act of collecting, 
itself, which very much is is tied into the story of of your life and how how you're building this collection, how it connects to the world around you. And really through the catalog and and through through thinking about this process in in a bit more of a connected way than it being a um, you know a, a kind of a hunting around, this really helps to kind of get a sense of what were some of the changes and transitions in your collecting practice as you were uh, building the collection, that, that static idea that we talk about. So moving on, we're gonna, we're gonna now talk about uh, four uh, case studies, just to, just, to, just to ground some of these ideas, and then, uh, and then we'll open up into conversation afterwards with, with Brian, and I really look forward to those conversations. So, you know, to begin, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking about this is a this is a client that I've been working with for a while now. Who, you know, this this collection started out. It was he got in touch with me when he was starting to move away from just collecting movie posters from Hollywood. He was someone who was not really engaged much with the with the trade or with auctions and where to source material. And this oftentimes resulted in him picking up, you know, posters when he was traveling around in Hollywood and also in Las Vegas. And so these were often posters that had signatures on them and had the certified uh, authentication certificates. They were purchased online to some extent. There were a few cabinet cards here and there. Um, and, and in some cases there were first editions that were connected to films that were adaptations. Um, these were often also um, purchased all through a very limited amount of sources. And so in looking at these, we started to have a conversation of, 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 of the interest of movies. Uh, this was a gentleman that uh, had grown up in, a, in, in, in an immigrant family, an Indian family that were in North America. Uh, they often watched films from the history of, of Indian cinema, which is a history which runs parallel with that of Hollywood. And we started to realize that there were absolutely opportunities to buy, uh, you know, bill cards and, and posters of some of some of those early films. And, and this started to expand into, into some of the discussions of, uh, you know, technological connections with cinema at the same time. So moving into some of the first sound films various moments within the history of South Asian cinema, uh, particularly the posters um, and, and these kind of, these really you know, early moments of, of the technology of cinema changing uh, elsewhere in the world. Now, parallel to that, there was then this discussion about uh, the, the theory, the history and the, and, and, and the practice of restoration of cinema uh, within the context of South South Asian cinema, and this expanded into uh, you know engagements with the National Film Archive in India, uh, the the Film and TV uh, Institute in India as well, and some of the theorists that you see coming out of South Asia talking very specifically about the South Asian experience of creating uh, cinema concurrently with uh, Hollywood, and and this is developed into a, into a collection that you know it, it has certainly objects based to it. It has posters that inaugurate moments in which certain films uh, premiered for the first time, but it also connects to some intellectual uh, foundations of the history, restoration again, and, and theory of, of cinema and the history of cinema in India, and has and now engaged with a, uh, with a college in the Lower Mainland, which studies uh, South Asian culture. And so there is a discussion there about making making the uh, reference library uh, available to those studies. So this is something where this collection moved from just working on uh, you, you know posters that were readily available during trips to connecting into family histories, histories of technology, histories of industry, uh, and 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 a sort of a larger world around the idea of of, of cinema and and world film. In a somewhat similar similar vein, uh, this is a collector that was gifted a library of Library of America collection, not the, obviously the complete run, but a very lengthy uh, run of 
of these authors. And what happened was is that the collection started to move into an interest in modern firsts. Um, and what's interesting is, is that this was when I started to engage with, with this client. Uh, we were working with cataloging the collection and thinking about um, directions, thinking about certain deaccessionings de of certain, certain uh, copies, because it was getting to a point where these were, this was very much a more special purchaser uh, focus area. The prices were getting uh, quite larger and it was to a point where the enthusiasm was just no longer there for the collector uh, moving forward. But he did have a couple of books that he'd picked up over the years from his travels of American authors as they appeared in other parts of the world. And so we started to set out working on uh, trying to you know, trying to locate and identify um, first appearances of some of those modern authors, the Hemingways, uh, Fitzgerald, um, Steinbeck, writers of this sort, as well as others, um, and, and starting to collect, you know, not only the first appearances of them, but also uh, interesting examples uh, from other parts of the world. So you see down on the bottom here, uh, you know, the, on the left side, uh, this is a, a Chinese copy of Grapes of Wrath. You have uh, the Russian copy of The Old Man in the Sea, the Danish copy of uh, Great Gatsby, Iranian copy of Lolita, where you can see there's a sort of a, a, a basically a, almost a scanned version. It's, a, it's very strange in person seeing this printout, but it's a, it, it's a still from Kubrick's uh, adaptation of the novel. And then On the Road, uh, published in Croatia in 1971. Now, this is just a sort of tip of the iceberg of a larger collection, which, you know, as we were talking about this collection, one of the things that he was talking about is, is that it kept feeling like, you know, he's just working on these first editions. They're, he's feeling that they're, they're getting a little too rich for his blood. There was a sort of embarrassment of showing them, and, and, and it didn't really communicate that much to people, you know, friends and family that he, he wanted to share the collecting with. But when he started to lay out on a table some of these <laughs> the various copies of even in some cases the same book, you know, it really engaged with people and exposed the collection to be something of a, a it had a real social element to it. And from there, it's expanded on into, um, you know, a, a graphics teacher being interested in the collection and, and having students visit it and take a look at it and discussions moving into the future of possibly placing uh, the collection as an example of the ways in which content of a book can be translated in different ways and marketed in different ways uh, throughout the world, particularly American uh, modern writers. So again, a, a move away from you know, the, uh, the, the, the gift, uh, which this was a, the uncle had gifted a, a larger collection of books, which had moved into the first editions. Certainly a, a, a very interesting area of collecting, but one that the enthusiasm was starting to wane, he was starting to wonder where he wanted to go. And then this kind of change into, you know, this idea of, you joke sometimes about, you know, judging a book by its cover, but it's really fascinating when you start to see the variations on a theme, uh, the, the, the themes that keep reoccurring, the ones that look really different uh, within the different cultural contexts. Now, this is, a, this is an interesting collection that connects with um, an idea of almost a vocational collection, someone who does something professionally which starts to engage with their, their collecting. And, and this is, of course, not a, a, a new phenomenon either. This is something that you know, I've seen in, in my own work and certainly in the history of collecting, uh, absolutely a reference library being made use of uh, in a professional context. Now, in this case, this is a uh, this is a uh, a collector who she's she's also an environmental lawyer, and is engaged with these discussions of of the environment. Um, the collection started with a gift, similarly to the earlier uh, earlier case study I was talking about, uh, and it started as a gift. It was a it was Rachel Carson's book, uh, Silent Spring. You may be familiar with it through the you know the use of pesticides and its impact on the natural environment, and. <clears throat> When I started uh, helping her with the process of sourcing materials and thinking about uh, what are, you know 
what's a fair price for certain objects that she was working on, what's the probability of these items appearing uh, in contexts of auction and catalogs into the future. You know, she started focusing on not only writers that engage with the wilderness and how we understand it within a North American context, mostly, um, but also started looking into fine press practices. Um, there was very much a connection with the, the labor of making a book and the fine, the quality of making that book. So, you know, there's here the Heritage Press version of, of Walden, which is, you know, a very a, a lovely copy, lovely, lovely idea to it. And then on into, you know, Wendell Berry's window poems with the, uh, with the uh, engravings performed by Wesley Bates. And then you have, um, you know, Andrew Steves Gaspar Press doing a, a kind of smaller print of, uh, of Aldo Leopold's Wherefore Wildlife Ecology, which is a, a kind of a work on, on sustainable working with the land. And this has moved into, uh, you know, as we've been thinking about this further, and, and I've been having these conversations about this direction onwards, uh, the process of how ecology uh, and, and alternatives to uh, certain forms of agrarian uh, uh, use of the land, but also um, certain forms of, of living in communities has changed over, particularly after World War II. So, you know, focusing on Ian McCarg, uh, his ideas through design with nature, which was, you know, adapted into a, into a television show that got a fairly large readership. Uh, some of you may be familiar also with, the, you know, the Whole Earth catalog and all of its iterations. Uh, there's a first edition in this collection, which, um, you know, is the first issue of, of many issues. And then it's gone into, more, more recently, in a really interesting way, into uh, intentional communities in the 1960s and 70s, uh, and some of the broadsides and, uh, and pamphlets connected with some of these groups. And so, Moving from this gift, from the engagement of pesticides impacting ecology, moving into in individuals in the environment and how writing such as Thoreau, Wendell Berry have, you know, the, how that's changed our perceptions of being, living with land, and then into these larger, um, larger communities, these kind of alternative approaches and perspectives to an engagement uh, in, in e ecological living. So that's one in which it, this is continuing to move on into more collective uh, practices, more earth movement. Um, and certainly the, she's also actively collecting a number of organizations that are, that are working at the moment. So this idea of really honing it down, it's actually broadening out into, into, uh, into larger, uh, a larger plane. Now, uh, just to, this is the one that I, I will, conclude on for the evening and, and then we'll have I'll have some closing remarks and then we can go into a conversation. This is a collection that connects with a question that I get quite a bit. This idea of where are the new collectors? How how are how are they coming into uh, what, what they do? And similarly to you know the last example I used of the gift, um, this was a collection that started out with a father and daughter and the the father collected modern firsts not on not dissimilar to the uh the graphic collection i was showing earlier um and he was engaged with with that collecting through the 80s into the 90s uh there's a point in time where he sold that collection and um and provided the the results of of the collection sale to the daughter who was building up a collection and there were actually some copies as well that stayed within her collection. And it was all to do with the history of film, with film adaptation of all sorts. But particularly, she was really interested in the film adaptations that took place in, from writers in the 1960s. Uh, so you see in here the uh, of Joseph Heller, Ken Kesey, uh, to name just a few, but uh, you know a number of the uh, a number of the books that were later ad adapted into what we know as the sort of new American cinema of the late 60s and into the 70s. Now, what happened is, is that as she built this collection, she started to move into, she was involved in the movie industry and continues to be. She started to get involved and interested in the actual process of making films. So storyboards, 
scripts, uh, these sorts of things. And this was connected very much through uh, through auction sales. Most of this was acquired through through auction processes. And as auctions went more online, turning into the 21st century, this is where that collection really started to focus. Uh, I've been engaging with this collection and the kind of latter portion of it, the iteration, which it'll be interesting to see where it goes. It's it's moving into this focus of precursors to cinema. She often talks about it as this idea of this, the cinematic imagination. How, what were the various manifestations within uh, culture that prepared humans for, for cinema as we know it, this, this kind of hybrid storytelling. And so, you know, as a result, this is a collection that's a multimedia collection. Uh, back to this idea of idea-based collecting, you know, it has harlequinades in it as well as um, zootropes and all sorts of other kind of optical ways of telling and uh, magic lanterns, things of this nature. And what's interesting is this, this also coincides, this change in the collection is also coincides with, with the development of, of, of a family. She she's, has two kids now. Uh, they're a little bit older now uh, as the collection keeps moving and they engage with these objects. Uh, this is this is sort of a passing on of of the really kind of physical tactile engagement, um, and this is something that when I'm working with people and trying to think about the future for their collections is how to facilitate these moments in which friends and family can connect with the collection in a variety of different ways. You know, they will people coming towards a collection that they may not be entirely familiar with will find ways to engage with it and I think oftentimes collectors you know because they've been working through and through and on the same objectives it starts to become a well-worn path and it's really interesting to talk to people once they've shared their collection in one way or another it doesn't mean to have just an exhibit or something like that it can be very informal but it can really open up uh, you know new ways of seeing the collection new ways of, in, of engaging with the with the world that's being presented and so, you know, to, to conclude for the evening, a couple of takeaways that, you know, I like to talk about is as soon as you identify as a collector, and this is particularly for emerging collectors, people who are starting out, is to start cataloging your collection. Start thinking about how those various objects connect to one another and communicate ideas and stories uh, and how they dictate some of the ways you'll be acquiring and looking for items into the future. Now, another thing is, is, is taking a planning approach to collecting. You know, back to this discussion of archetypes of collectors. You know, there's historically determined types of collectors from the past, the idea of, of the, the feverish collector, the one that is you know, haunted by the items that got away. You know, we're, we're in a period of time in which the information that is available to collectors results in, in much less risk being taken on for people building collections. There's enough quality information uh, that lowers the risk and, and results in happier hunting. You know, it, it, there's often a criticism that you know, thinking analytically can impact uh, negatively the way in which you build your collections. And, you know, the evidence of, of the collectors that I work with is that it actually allows them to really know when there are the moments they are face to face with something that is really exceptional uh, in the collection that they're building. And particularly if you're thinking about it in terms of idea collecting, where sometimes that can be, it can feel like a rudderless you know, project because it's not connected to some of these predetermined bibliographies, but has, you know, has uh, has seeds in it for for some interesting uh, results and interesting ways of telling uh, to people into the future and communicating uh, in, in various ways. You know, and then another thing to discuss in terms of once one's cataloged a collection is this idea that a collection is made up of collections of multiple. Uh, lines of thought that one is engaging with uh, through the objects that you're gathering. And, and so with that, I, you know, I, 
I would open it up on to, uh, to a discussion with, with Brian and, and of course your questions coming through in the chat. I, uh, I really look forward to those. And, um, and thanks again for your attention and, and your interest in, in the topic for today. And if anyone has any further questions or wants to discuss further um, the practices that they're collecting or, or their thoughts for the future they're collecting, uh, please get in touch. Thank you, Stuart. This is, uh, this is delightful. And what this is about here is like we're sitting around the, the fire or somebody's kitchen or somebody's living room and just kind of having a beer or a glass of wine or a cup of tea and kind of sharing those ideas. So that's what it's about. So I'm going to uh, steal your uh, um, steal the screen back from you, if I may, and yeah. just put a couple of things up. Show my screen, too. And we're going to put this up here over here and just do a couple of things. But, but we did decide we we're going to leave plenty of time for questions and right. all those kind of things. So and before we do that, we're going to get right to that. But I just wanted to uh, do a couple of things. I could do my my manuscript society commercial. In essence, uh, May 10th to 14th, we have our annual meeting down in, in Williamsburg and Richmond, Virginia. That one is pretty much full, but we do this every year. We go, well, not with COVID, but for the most part, we do this pretty much every year. And uh, the best part, I think the best part of this is you get to go past those doors where it says staff only, library staff only, museum staff only, cast member only, depending upon where we are. And we get to go behind the scenes, talk with people who are making things happen. Um, and it's a, it's a great opportunity. So keep that in mind too. Manuscript Mondays comes up, as I said, the first Monday of every month. Uh, Fourth of July is gonna be Manuscript Monday on a Tuesday because that happens to be a Monday. But we have a lot of upcoming programs. One is um, gonna, we're gonna cover things about this idea that your kids don't want your stuff. What do you do with it? And there's gonna be opportunities to have a panel discussion about whether you're going to sell it, catalog it, um, keep it, hoard it, distribute it to family, donate it, sell it, uh, have, consign it to somebody, all kinds of things about that. And, and certainly Spencer's gonna be able to tell us more about that as we get further into that too. Another one is I wanna talk about ink and paper uh, and all the medium of manuscripts. Let's talk about the different kinds of pens. Let's talk about the different kinds of paper, the different kinds of ink. That's another one. Brad's on the on this too. I haven't talked to Brad yet, or I may have briefly mentioned it, but Brad and I, um, he doesn't know this yet, and <laughs> he may not do it, is we want to do a program on how to get invited back to a library or a museum after you've been there. And basically, it's etiquette. What do you do in a museum? I've seen people carry uh, felt tip markers into a rare book library. I've seen people drag their Manuscript Society badges as they lean over a document signed by Button Gwinnett that, uh, that some libraries have put out for us too. So there are some upcoming things. We we're talking about uh, anything related to collectibles. It doesn't have to be manuscripts. It doesn't have to be books. So keep that in mind as you look forward. Uh, get on our mailing list. We'll tell you how to do that in just a little bit. And before I get to, uh, get to we open it up to questions, just a couple of things. There's gonna be a certificate of attendance available to you right after this is over. You're gonna get a, a thank you email and it's gonna say your certificate is attached. People said, well, why are you giving a certificate out? A lot of folks here are looking for continuing education credits. We're an educational organization. We bring in speakers and presenters like Spencer who are certainly experts in their field and can share ideas that are gonna be really important to us. So look for that. There's a button to click. It's gonna take a long time to download. I'm still arguing with GoToWebinar people that it's not them, uh, that it's them and not us. Everybody takes a long time. If you can't download it and you need it, let me know. Just so you know, we do not um, send them off to your appraisal organizations or your Society of American Archivist organizations, but it's available to you too as well. We're gonna read this uh, webinar has been recorded. You can watch this webinar anytime. It'll be posted on the Manuscript Society website. Um, it will be up there in just a little bit. And all the other ones are up there too. No charge. You don't have to be a member. This is just a service that we provide to you. And a thank you to the trustees and staff of the Manuscript Society uh, and to you for being part of the program. Don't go anywhere because we're getting to the best part now, which is questions. Uh, Stuart's telephone number there and email is there. I'm going to leave that up. And if you have questions or thoughts, um, and I got plenty, let me just go to attendees here. You can raise your hand. Mark has a question. Let me go to Mark's question here and see. Um, Mark, can I un uh, can I unmute you? Would you like to ask that question? I'm going to do that and 
you're going to have to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask that question. Me? Yes, sir. I can certainly can, sir. Yes, sir. I, I was just curious. I mean, the, the whole history of collecting books and manuscripts and and where it started. Are there any standard or recommended uh, uh, books on the history of uh, book and uh, uh, autograph uh, collecting? Yeah, I would start with uh, Nicholas Baspain's writing. Uh, both his books and his his article column that he had in Fine Book Magazine. I think he still contributes uh, occasionally. Um, excellent writing, really interesting, and talks about not only the contents of collections but also the the psychology behind it as well, or these various models um, of of you know practicing one's collecting. So I I would start with those um, if you haven't had a look. Uh, yeah. Can I ask you to repeat the the author's last name? Nicholas Bas Basbains. B Spell that for us. Uh, is it B A B A I S? I need to double check. Sorry, didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's right here. He's looking it up. There you go. Right. B A S B A N E S. And he does have a website here that I can push through. But I would say certainly a, an excellent start for for the private um, for the private you know individual collecting practice. Okay, thank you, and I enjoyed the talk very much. Great. Thank you, thank you Mark. That's great. Other questions? Just uh, either post them up there or. Um, just raise your hand. A little hand will do that. I have a, Spencer, help us understand the difference between a collection and, a, and an accumulation, whether it be in any collectible field. We talk about it with stamps and with coins and with autographs and with uh, just about anything, whether it be a, a technology. Uh, so what can you identify the difference between a collection and a uh, an accumulation, and why one would put one together versus the other? Right. Um you know, I think I, I sort of touch on this in some of the articles that I provided uh, the white papers prior to this, but, you know, in thinking about a collection for a second, thinking, you know, imagine it separated from the collector that's built it. And I like to think about uh, the bookseller Lauren Bear's idea that a hundred of anything is interesting. Uh, you know, and so in that sense, you know, accumulation can in some ways communicate an idea about a past period of time um now so that's one that's one thought mm -hmm. stepping back into the actual the private collector and this connection between accumulations and collections i would say it it happens at a point in which uh there is a sort of a, a dedicated investment of time and money towards objectives towards mm -hmm. objects that you feel have elective affinities to other objects in the collection that you're considering so it could be it could be cameras you mm -hmm. know it could be uh, it could be prints it could be uh, uh, books of one sort or another when you start to imagine either imagine wondering you know I wonder if this book such a book exists or such a print exists or if you start to do research and realize that there are some items that connect to another artist, you know, say, um, you know, the photography books of Danny Lyons or Larry Clark or something like that, where you start to go, I, I would like to see the progression of someone's career. I think that's when you start to go into that realm of, of engaging with being a collector. And when Got you seem to be able to connect with your objects in your collection as having milestones, as having parts where they're like this, this object really is rare in relation to some of the other objects. Can um, you share an exa example of that? Yeah, I mean, um, like a like a, a more recent example that I can think of is is one in which you know I'm engaging with a collection right now of uh, that works on the idea of. Um, fairy tales, the, the various approaches and uh, engagements with fairy tales. 
not necessarily just you know Andrew the, the blue books or whatever they might be but thinking about how does it engage with other parts of the culture and you know there are some opportunities at the moment to acquire some material through the estate of Karl Lagerfeld that are coming out in the Sotheby's catalog for oh, sure and, you know these items acquiring these into the collection would start to connect into a discussion that's been had about fashion and fairy tale. Um, so, you know, that would be an object that if acquired into the collection would start to move into that path of, of an opportunity. The particular objects are actually preparatory sketches for a, uh, for a show that he did that was connected with Hans Christian Andersen in a very specific way and was mm -hmm. one that really kind of, it was an extremely uh, successful collection moving forward. And part of the reason for that was because a lot of the themes really resonated with people. It connected with that kind of fairy tale and fashion quality. So you know, that would be an example of just, just today. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great example. So are you a collector? I, I've been on and off, you know, at the moment I'm, I'm you know, I, I gather reference books all the time. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a different thing. I'm, I'm, I make use of those as reference library, uh, but over time, I've you know I've had a variety of collections. I had a, a typewriter collection for a period of time that got up there um, into the 20s, 25 <laughs> typewriters. But specifically, they were connected with the typewriters that were um, that were made use of by writers that I was really yeah into. for sure. And mm -hmm. really thinking about this idea of the, you know, it started obviously with Jack Kerouac on the road, these ideas of marathon typing, like what would that physically feel like? Um, yeah. And how technologies like that changed the process of making, making a novel, you know, typing it out. And then I mm -hmm. also had a, a collection of, of early, early and first issues when I could, um, uh, hard bop vinyls. So, mm -hmm. The Blue Note, Impulse, uh, and other others like it, uh, because not you know I'm a musician myself, uh, you know on the side, and I engage with that music a lot. But also just that you know the graphic design is incredible. The personnel on those records was great. The uh, the fidelity of those early pressings is fantastic. So you know that was a real that was a win 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 sort of thing. But it was difficult to keep that going. It was one that mm -hmm. is an area that's still developing, and uh, and you know. Uh, moving a couple of times, it starts to add to it. So I'm uh, I'm recovering at the moment. <laughs> hey, Brad Cook has a question. Brad, I'm going to unmute you if I may, and you can say hi to everybody and check in with Spencer with your question. Hi, Spencer. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Brad. It's good to hear from you. So, um, great presentation, by the way. <clears throat> um, the the one thing I I noticed. Uh, you mentioned that a collection is made up of collections. I'm an archivist. Um, so can you just clarify that a bit for me? And do you, or do you, did you specifically mean that a collection is made up of accessions or are you being literal in that a collection is made up of collections? I mean, I could understand that a collection is made yeah. up of multiple collections, but yeah, for some there's a, there's a difference there. Yeah, I mean, what, what I mean by this in, in the context of how I, how I engage with it is that when one is building a collection as a private individual, uh, there are objects that are orbiting around an idea. Uh, so it's a bit, it's it's less in the arch, arch, archival context. It's more about um, constellations of ideas and and where you're going in terms of your engagement. So, you know, an example I can think of is there's a collection I work with where the collector started out with photo photo exhibition surveys. So, uh, you know, family of man, the photographer's eye, things of this nature, really setting up how photography uh, in the 20th century established itself, you know, in, in Europe, and also North America as an art form, and when it got its place in MoMA and, and other places like that. Um, you know, this collection, as that collection was starting to build and he was buying those catalogs, he started to, when the opportunity presented itself, purchase Ballhaus related photo collections. So photo books, prints, things of that nature. And around that same time, started to also engage with some of the 
you know, some of the pamphlet designs that were taking place, graphic designs at that same time. So, you know, they all touch on photographic reproduction in one way or another overall, but have, you know, a, a, a general focus in the exhibits that were happening, those, ca those exhibition catalogs, specifically with Bauhaus and the kind of more formal approaches to photographic practice, the more abstract photography that you see uh, in the 20th century, and then more focused and more connected with his profession as a graphic designer himself with pamphlets and, and how Bauhaus impacted typography and uh, arrangement. So that's what I mean is, you know, you think about he has a collection, but within it, there's, you know, you could show one of those one of those veins and it would it would you know you could engage a conversation for you know an entire lesson if you wanted so that's what i mean by that is if you step back you can start to see those uh, and maybe that starts to make decisions as to what you really want to focus on moving forward anything else brad no i'm good good hey by the way thanks for all you do for the manuscript society brad cook is our editor uh, as you mentioned, an archivist, an incredible guy, a, a wealth of knowledge. Tap into his expertise. Uh, take a look at the new issue of Manuscripts that just came out. Uh, and he's always looking for articles. Isn't that right, sir? That is correct. <laughs> Good deal. That's great. I'm waiting for um, Spencer's next article. <laughs> there you go. All righty. I'm going to mute you there. Dr. Stuart Embry, I'm going to unmute you because it looks like you have your hand up and probably have a question. Is that correct, sir? Maybe not. Maybe he just was putting his hand up and down. All right. I don't think we got him there too. It's good. Spencer, what instrument do you play and what kind of music do you like? Uh, drums. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And what, right, are, we a, are we a rock drummer? Or are we a classical uh, orchestra drummer? What do you do? I have done it all. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I think percussionist in, in, in general. Um, I'm not playing in any groups at the moment, but I've done all sorts of all sorts of musical uh, forms. So that's great. That's good. Did your parents buy you those drums, or did they get, tell you to move out of the house after you bought your first kit? <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I collected cans when I was a kid in order to make enough to <laughs> get the kit, that's and, and that, that that's cured my I, sincerity in the in the endeavor for sure. I was a big fan of spackle buckets. They made a lot of noise, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can I That's ask great. my question? Hello? Oh, there you are. Good. Dr. Yeah. Embry, you are there. Go ahead. Fire away, my friend. Yeah, okay. Um, what, what, uh, you mentioned software. Uh, I have a really large collection of uh, manuscript material, and I've been using Microsoft Database. Is that an uh, adequate one, or is there a better to keep track of your collection? Yeah, I, th I think that's a good start, um, or or Excel or something of that sort, where you can start to put things in into fields, and then move into you know other softwares. Uh, one of the things that I, I think is important is to start off by making sure that the quality of the information is is up up to standard for you, and and really working on it in kind of simpler terms of, of an Excel sheet, something of this nature, and then start looking around. One of the issues I'm noticing with some of the, the, the private softwares at the moment is, is there seems to be a consolidation that's taking place of a lot of the soft of the collection softwares that are centered around the cloud. And so the, the costs of purchasing and engaging with them is increasing, and also just the access to it uh, in terms of my own professional engagement, I, I I avoid some of them just because there are these sort of third party clauses in which they're renting the server space from from other other sources, and this opens up the possibility that all the time that you've put into uh, <laughs> to that could be potentially lost. So I I often encourage um, you know working through through an Excel sheet to begin with um, just to get the feel for it. Um, I think that's a I think it's a great idea. And Stuart, if I could just build on that, uh, Excel is probably the uh, most functional interactive database. Almost everybody uses it, and all that data can be easily transferred back and forth. The challenge, as Spencer mentions, and Brad can probably comment at this too as an archivist, is how do you set up the fields that you're going to create? Uh, with Excel, you can add them along the way, but just putting a 
a name and a title or whatever isn't necessarily enough. We might need dates, we might need sizes, we might need content, we might need cross references to it. So you can build out on that with that, uh, as opposed to a lot of the, the some of the other commercial databases. Some are spectacular. We're not not uh, endorsing one over the other, but I think it's something that you should look into. And I think the the toughest part is to figure out what do you want to do with it, what information do you need as you before you start to load it all in. Spencer, thoughts on wow. that? Well, yeah, uh, Microsoft Access. You can, you can. I think you can uh, put that over into an Excel, but uh, right, absolutely, absolutely. So it's just a matter of getting, figure out what information do you need and what's important. Stuart, thoughts? I think compatibility is is a good point. Uh, one thing I like to do is, you know, is putting in fields at least from the beginning until you start to find like funky or other fields that you want to engage with but starting out with the ones that you see in third-party aggregators of auction results, um, mm -hmm. that one helps. Uh, so look at what Rare Book Hub's doing, what Art Price is doing, what other um, other services of that sort are doing. Especially if you're building out your collection, it helps because it you, you start to be able to reference it quicker. Um, and then I think, yeah, your, your comment about consistency in the naming style is is also useful. If you, you know, if you're doing all caps, last name first, uh, or, or just finding a style and sticking with it, um, I, I think is, is really is important and useful moving forward. Good point. Uh, you Dr. Try, Ellis, you, go ahead. Go, Stuart, you, you, go ahead. Should you, should you try to get uh, images of your letters and things, or is that overkill? Uh, you, you can. I mean, I, I think. Um, if you are going to have images of it, uh, what you can do is put together, start having sort of accession, uh, quick hand accession code for the items that you have. So if you can tie it into maybe possibly the purchase date uh, and some other information, um, just, to, just to have that connected with the JPEG that you upload into your computer. So there's a correspondence between the spreadsheet that you have and the image so that you can search them both quite easily. Basically turning the Excel sheet into an index for the photo collection that you have of the items. Um, I think it's certainly, uh, you know, if there are particular details that, that are really pertinent to, to that particular item, um, yeah, in some cases, you know, that, that, that's a good idea. That's okay, great. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Stuart, that's great. And not only that, but it actually we're cross-referencing 12,000 items for a, a potential donation is coming up someone's making a donation and mm -hmm. the pictures were there the information where it was just kind of all discombobulated so figuring out how to do that right up front is really important brad says not only that brian but uh how to make sure that the information is migrated to new software over time lotus one two three is something you may have started with way back when uh it, converting that to excel is nearly impossible now when you look at the early code from uh from the Apollo uh, program, most of that stuff is not transferable in any way. It's lost it over time. Uh, Brad can probably talk more about that. I'm gonna open it up just for a second. Uh, uh, Richard Ellis, Dr. Ellis had a question, so I am going to, it's a long question. So Dr. Ellis, I'm gonna open you up so uh, and mute you so you can use your mic and you can ask Spencer directly and then we'll probably need to wrap this up in just a little bit, but go ahead. Um, can gotcha. you hear me all right? Yes, yeah. sir. You sound great. I'll, I'll just read the question that I wrote. It, it really comes down to how does a, contector, a collector control their general madness? I collect um, uh, medical letters, but I found that that soon meant I'm also collecting history letters and science <laughs> as well. And then I hit uh, certain people like Pasteur or Darwin, and I start another collection with all of them. Uh, and even uh, tangents, when I've gone into a dealer, um, I find uh, I have an interest in suddenly I've got a huge collection of Olympic posters starting with Jesse <laughs> Owen. So how do you control that? What things do you put in to kind of control the tangents and keep your collection uh, a little narrower, which many people advise me to do? Yeah, I, I think one of the, one of the things that well first um, is is to start to document the collection, start to map it out. You know the way the way that you lined it up right now, I, I get a kind of sense of of some of the directions that it's going. But what that helps to do is kind of externalize it a bit. Um, 
and maybe get a sense of some of those areas um, and maybe also get a sense of the timeline of those 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 purchases sometimes it's you know the the acquisition of the uh, the olympic posters for instance it can be interesting how that's like a bio, it's a biographical element to your collection you know oftentimes i when i'm dealing with collectors will start to look at like concentrations of acquisitions of a particular type and it's connected to either something personally that they were thinking about or something that was going on in the in the world at that time but starting to think about the those dynamics you know it helps with the act of externalizing the collection through cataloging so that's sort of the way it starts um, and, and working through it in that process um, and you know as that's happening also thinking about you know what is you know is that a wholly negative feeling that you have towards the collection that you're building you know if you're if it's something that you're enjoying in the way that you're you're gathering it is is a part of that then you know i don't know if that's entirely something that you should try and prevent um but if it's something where you feel like it's getting somewhat um beyond you or feeling like it's something that's possessing you in a way I think one way to do it is certainly to to step back and take stock of what you have and what are some of the stories that you can engage with others about. I think bringing people into the conversation about your collecting too, like showing these items to to fellow collectors or to friends and family, um, can also kind of engage engage you in in that process. So um, I hope that kind of starts to touch on on some of those uh some of those possible it, perspectives it does that's Thank great you good deal you bet hey brad got a couple of thoughts here i'm going to open brad up again because uh not only does brad have some good information to share with us but he just told me that he was a drummer for a short time as well brad you're you're on again well with, with what spencer was just saying i had the thought that i what i've told people often is that it's it's also a matter of simple self-control <laughs> that you just have to tell yourself sometimes, no, I'm not going to collect that because while it is related to the area I'm collecting in, it's not specific to the area that I'm collecting in. And um, but sometimes just setting up that absolute boundary can help you out greatly. Yeah, and, and also it's, like, oh, sorry. No, I was just gonna say it's hard, but you, but people can do it. Yeah, I think like to add to that, um, when I work with collectors, is co qualifying the 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 act of collecting that you're doing. Are you looking towards exemplary objects in a particular focus, or are you looking for examples like duplicates of of a you know? Are you looking at uh, the best copy of a book? Mm -hmm. Are you looking at the various editions of that book? Um, you know, so that can help. If you if you start to realize that you're a conditioned collector, that that it, it gives you a reason to say no. Mm -hmm. like, this is I can find a better copy. I know there's a better copy out there. I have the information that informs me of this. I can wait. You know, it's not so much a no, but it, that turns into a waiting, um, which changes the relationship, right? But if you are, say, looking for duplicates, condition doesn't become an issue. And so therefore the price of the object is probably less. You just need more space, <laughs> you know, and that becomes, the <laughs> right? So it's a trade-off where you start to think about, okay, you know, am I collecting the exemplary example of a paper mache binding, or do I just want the version of a particular issue of a paper mache binding? In that case, yeah. you can find a lot of chipped paper mache bindings, you know? Um, However, finding one that's in better condition is is a is really a difficult process. I'm working with a collector at the moment about that, and it's you know we're more on the condition line of things. It, there's a lot of no's. <laughs> Good point. Well done. Good deal. Uh, Mark just typed. Are there any psychiatrists that specialize in treating? autograph collecting mania <laughs> it could be a field and this would be a good this is probably a good base so any psychiatrist looking to specialize on that should join the manuscript society they'll they'll be busy for a long time hey brad i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna mute you off here okay and uh, and we're gonna wrap up for the day good deal all right um we are gonna call it a night i got one more thing for you and then before i uh, do i want to certainly thank spencer for coming out 
and spending a great time. And for all of your questions, for you attending and being part of it, it's the discussion that really makes it interesting. We get to learn a lot more about each other. We get to learn about fields, some things we never knew. And we certainly learned a lot more about collecting and how that all works. So you can get a lot more information at the Manuscript Society website, manuscript.org. If you're not a member, you should be one. Um, you get all the benefits of membership. Uh, you get to connect with collectors along the way. Sometimes there are local chapter meetings. We're going to leave that all to everybody. Spencer, anything, uh, closing thoughts before we call it a night? Uh, no, just other than thank you, Brian, for, for putting this together. And, and Brad, thank you for getting in touch initially about the article and, and, and this led to the presentation. So much appreciated. And, uh, I, and I look forward to the next uh, Manuscript Monday. It's really interesting programming. Good deal. Thank you so much. It has certainly been a pleasure uh, learning from you and, and sharing, uh, sharing the Manuscript Society Monday with you, too. So take care, y'all. Have a good night. We'll see you next month, next month, first of the month for Manuscript Monday. Good night, y'all.